Welcome to the Korea Pro Podcast. I'm your host, Chung Min Kim, the Editorial Director of Korea Pro. And I'm John Lee, the Editor of Korea Pro. Join us for a weekly 15-minute conversation as we dive into the most pressing stories shaping South Korea and dissect the most complicated ones for you. From politics to culture, technology to society, we've got you covered. So stay ahead of the curve and never be sidelined again. So get ready for a fresh perspective on South Korea's news. This is the Korea Pro Podcast. All right, welcome back to the Korea Pro Podcast. I'm your co-host, John, joined by Chung Min Kim. Now, we've got something rather important to discuss today, so we're just uh, going to dive right in. Now, we have to, of course, start with context. Now, last week, uh, we had a Korean-American scholar, Sumi Terry, uh, indicted by the U.S. courts uh, for allegedly, at this point... It's not uh, a verdict yet. It's not a verdict yet, for allegedly working with South Korean NIS officials as the National Intelligence Service, mm. uh, receiving uh, bribes in the form of cash and other sorts of luxury uh, goods items and it seems that the crux of the matter was that she had not registered under the U.S. FARA law which right, stands for Right and it was like an influence operation from the South Korean side according to the indictment Right and FARA standing for the Foreign Agents Registration Act and so um, because of all of this kerfuffle that's been going on regarding Sumiteri in D.C., uh, there has been a lot of political infighting within South Korea as right. well. Right. Just the gist is that the lawmakers of the uh, the both two major parties were accusing each other of the their own administrations right. for failing. It started off with the presidential office saying that they are going to investigate and reprimand former Moon Jae-in administration officials Mm -hmm. for meeting with her. And the Democratic Party responded. you know, like replacing experts at NIS with amateurs, quote unquote. And the Democratic Party responded. They were saying that, yeah, uh, Sumi Terry met with South Korean officials 52 times. But among those 52 times, the majority of those meetings took place with the unit administration. Mm. And so because of all this back and forth that's been going on, finally there's been some movement to reform South Korean law. Right. And this is technically not new because during the previous 21st National Assembly, this has been constantly mentioned from both DP and PPP, Democratic Party and People Power Party saying that our 1953 criminal act about um, espionage cases, punishments, it's too outdated. No, it's part of the, cr- uh, the criminal act. Right. And it's a partial amendment. Article 98 mm. is what uh, they deal with spies. Mm. And this law had not been amended since it was first promulgated. So it's like half Hanja, the Chinese characters, of course. But uh, just to walk you through the what's being proposed right now. By the way, this is proposed by Park Sun Won, lawmaker of the Democratic Party, and by the way, who used to be the deputy chief of NIS under the Moon administration. And guess who co-signed it? Park Ji Won, the NIS chief at the time, who is a lawmaker right now. And the gist of the um, of the proposal of the partial amendment of the criminal act is first to um, redefine the target. It used to be just Chokguk, which is enemy country, or Chunjokguk, quasi enemy country. But if you look at the wording, it sort of only refers to North Korea because it's uh, someone who you're at war with. The law in its current form says enemy country, mm, enemy which country. in practice really me- only refers to North Korea. Right. So the point of the point of the proposal is to say uh, they actually directly stated. Influence operation is a big competition between countries, even between Ubanguk, friendly countries or allies. So um, in order to reflect the changes in the, you know, modern modern diplomacy, uh, they have to they, they're saying that the, the, the width of what's targeted has to be has to include foreign just foreign countries as well or organizations of foreign countries. So in a nutshell, what Park Sun-on wants is to introduce the k Farah law. Yeah. And there's got to be a, quite a bit of a pushback to this because uh, when Park Sun-on proposed this law, uh, now we saw the document and we saw him giving the press briefing. Mm. And in the press briefing, he was actually very explicitly stating Sumi Terry's example. He was saying, what if, uh, because of this law that we have right now, what if someone who is trying to work for, or what if someone who's working for the U.S. government mm. tries to influence South Korean politics? Mm. And he explicitly mentioned the U.S. He mm. didn't say China or Russia or Japan. He mentioned explicitly mm. the United States. Mm. And so uh, this has already gotten some people's ears perked up. Mm. 
Uh, some people are saying, okay, is this law going to be interpreted in a way that um, discriminately only targets American influences? Mm. Or is it going to target uh, all countries uh, going equally? Mm. So this is going to be uh, quite a, a risk factor that people right, are going to Right, and also at first, for. because of how Park Sun Won sort of framed it, like it sort of read like a tit for tat at first, but then if you look at the actual law it will apply to wide ranging uh new targets really right and yeah uh so but rather than those foreign entities like people who talk to those foreign entities really well that's the problem w w with the current proposed law mm. the phrase that is used is to exert influence mm. and if we are only looking at exert influence anything can be viewed as exerting influence i remember uh just a year ago the u.s chamber of commerce was very dead set against south korea's uh, uh promulgation of the network usage fee law mm. which would have been really uh, a law that could have heavily impacted u.s websites like mm. netflix and youtube and so the u.s chamber of commerce uh made several official statements opposing this law, saying that if this law is passed, it could negatively impact U.S.-South Korea relations. Mm. Now, is that going to be an example of trying to exert influence in South Korea? Right, and going back to the Terry case as well, the whole influence operation, the definition of it, like what constitutes an influence operation, operation uh, that has been also a controversy in general, right? Because the indictment includes stuff like uh, promoting certain policy for South Korea, South Korean government, or, you know, for instance, trilateral relations, bilateral relations, whatnot. Uh, but devil's advocate, um, if we are not talking about just the U.S., it is like a known secret that Chinese academics, which is under the, the party, Chinese party, uh, it's like a known secret that the influence operations against South Korean academics is a thing and it's been going on for decades. Uh, and it really peaked when South Korea had uh, installed fat anti-missile batteries yeah, exactly. in South Korea. Like they would invite uh, academics for a really nice banquet, really nice dinner, treat them nicely. It's not like they are discussing something like discreetly, like sharing information, classified information or anything, but they treat them nice and they pursue persuade the academics to say something nice about Chinese policy in the Indo-Pacific or something. Right? right, and that is all try uh, very soft forms of trying to influence other countries' lawmakers mm. and other, other, other countries' uh, scholars and uh, think tanks. Right. And that's been going on not just, of course, only in South Korea, but globally mm. for as long as statecraft has existed. <laughs> that's true. Uh, but the way that this law is being proposed in its current form would criminalize mm. all of that. Yeah. And that would have a really chilling effect, not only on obviously spies, right. but on academic exchanges, think tanks, uh, even just uh, government officials meeting other people. Mm. It could have a really b important chilling effect, which I'm not quite sure if, uh, if Pak Sonon actually thought this through. I think maybe they did think this through a little bit, looking at the technicalities of the clauses, because the punishment level is different. If it's for the, it's working actively for the enemy country, it's as up to Sahyong, uh, execution. execution, because this is an old law. But if it's just influence operation related stuff or related to foreign countries in general, it's as low as three years. Uh, so th I think they try to sort of differentiate between different levels, but also because it's so vaguely termed, it's quite difficult in reality, probably. And you mentioned this earlier. Uh, South. This is not the first time South Korea is pushing for this law. Mm. South Korea did talk about this law last year. Now, Why did it get rejected, though? Now, for those of you who might not uh, remember this, that there was a time last year, early last year, when there were rumors of these clandestine Chinese police stations, uh, supposedly that were operating in South Korea to track down Chinese dissidents. Mm, so this was more about China at the time. It was about China at the time. But the law at the time was still the same law that we're talking about today. Mm. The law only specified enemy countries, mm. which China is not. Mm. And so... Even if the secret police stations were in South Korea, the law did not allow the authorities to actually go after these individuals. Right. Now, because of that, uh, the, the, there was all this proposal to amend the law as well. Both, but there by was both parties, by right? By both the Democratic Party and the People Power Party. But the pushback came from the, judici from the judiciary. Mm. What the ju uh, judiciary was saying at the time was that if we make this into a blanket law, mm. and we then we're going to have the... 
then we're going to come into this very awkward position where the law would have to treat, say, American and Chinese influence operators or espionage or spies mm. in the same way. Is it, is it in any way possible to, well, well I, I'm asking this, but I know it's already quite tricky, but ch- there's a term, quasi-enemy state. Well, well, but, but making China sound like will open up a can of worms, right? Is China even a quasi enemy state? It's not states? because it's the bi- one of the biggest training partners for South Korea, and South Korea is trying very hard to not be in a hostile relations with China. Well, I'm not a diplomat, so I don't really have to cover myself from saying this, but mm. there is a strong argument to make to say that China is a mm. quasi enemy state. Mm. If we look at all of the espionage cases, the majority of them involve Chinese spies. Yeah, and cybersecurity issues. And cybersecurity well. issues as well. And so there has a lot of bit, there's already been this state of, shall we say, tension and unfriendliness between South Korea and China, even mm. though officially we are all they smiles and we're all trade partners. But would we actually dare to officially declare China as it, such it, a state? For instance, in a ruling, exactly. that will open up a diplomatic spats. And what about Russia? Well, Russia is also another case entirely. Now, Russia might be a, a less of an issue right now because we already have sanctions placed on, on the Russian government, Russian mm. businesses and entities. And also, we are sort of looking at North Korea and Russia sort of in a packet now since the NATO summit. Since um, Vladimir Putin visited Kim Jong-un Pyongyang. So, uh, Russia would be less of a, uh, a bomb that we would be having to deal with. But China is the big elephant in the room. Right. And so... Because of the judiciary's concerns about Mm. how this law would have forced South Korean law to treat American and Chinese officials, Mm. one an ally and one a very important trading country, Mm. to treat them in the same way with the Mm. law. That's uh, that would have also made things very diplomatically untenable. I I think that would be part of the reason why PPP. M- might not be completely on board with this version, right? There is a very good chance that the People Power Party will say that this law is politicized. And it's not just for the the general principles that we just discussed. Mm. It's also to do with the political infighting that we also mentioned earlier. That's right. most likely going to be their most immediate concern. I-, I can already imagine DP using this to uh, accuse a lot of unit administration officials like Park Jin for being pro-Japanese influence operation sort of agents and the PPP accusing DP for same thing with China. Exactly. Uh, when Yoon met with uh, jo- uh, Joe Biden and Fumio Kishida in Camp David, mm. the DP uh, made a statement saying that Yoon made, uh, made South Korea subservient to these both countries. Mm. And in the official statement, they said, what did South Korea gain out of this meeting? Mm. And so, yes, there's a very good chance that the Democratic Party will say, hey, you are sub- uh, making South Korea subservient to the U.S. and Japan. Influenced by... Influenced by Tokyo and Washington and God knows who else is coming from there. Mm. Whose president are you? Mm. And that's going to be their line of thinking. And the people and the People Power Party is going to say the same thing. Remember when? Yes, yeah, thing. It's not about just yes, yeah, yeah. Sure, that's going to be for Lee Jae Myung. But we also have to talk about President Moon. Mm. When President Moon went to China a few years ago, when he was still president, he described China as this big mountain peak, mm. whereas South Korea is a small country. Mm. And so th- that was where Yoon got this uh, um, of talking point of right. being able to accuse the Democratic Party, saying you are making South Korea serving to China. Right. And also, I'm just going to point out Park sun is also risking um, himself a little bit here because he used to be at the Shanghai consulate during that time when the Thad controversy was going on. Now, to be fair, he did only serve for six months, which right. was unusual. They only they usually last two to three years. That usually means that you worked on particular agenda. A particular agenda, sure. And at the time... Especially, it was uh, since uh, uh, ar- ar- around the time when President Moon was trying to uh, have this detente with North Korea. I'm pretty sure mm. that there was a, a, t- a brief period of time in Park Sonan's life when mm. he was in China, when the phrase "end of war" declaration did not just leave him ever. Well, end of war declaration was 2021, right? And by by the way, in 2021 in November, he was at the NIS. Exactly. Mm. And so this is a lot of people trying to basically. Cover their own asses. Stay ahead in understanding South Korean politics, business and society with the Korea Pro subscription. Gain access to daily email newsletters, expert briefings and exclusive events designed for professionals like you. As a podcast listener, you can now try Korea Pro for free and subscribe at a discounted rate if you like what we're doing. 
equip yourself with the insights that matter most. Visit careerpro.org forward slash podcast to subscribe and ensure you never miss a critical update. Career Pro, never be sidelined again. So moving on from like state to state, like government to government sort of relations, this like foreign entity part, it also includes companies. So what will be the impact on the ground? Well, that's the exact thing. When we come talk about foreign entities and, we, and if we're going to talk about influence operations, mm. we cannot ignore defense companies. Yeah. Defense and politics can never be separated. In and any country. In any country. Uh, if South Korea wants to buy, say, F-15s or F-35s going forward, then which companies are going to start coming into South Korea to try to influence the South Korean government to buy a certain jet from a certain company? Right, and there are a lot of um, a lot of intermediaries who used to be high levels or working levels at, at defense ministry, foreign ministry, industries ministry, who end up moving on with their career, joining like foreign companies as well, right? Uh, well, how are we going to define that going forward? Well, that's the big question mark. And I think that's why we need to keep a very close eye on how this law goes forward in its uh, amendments. And we will keep you posted. And if there's any kind of topic that you would like for us to cover on this podcast, please send us your suggestions at podcast at koreapro.org. And also please leave a review on wherever you're listening to this podcast. Week that was and week ahead. Uh, what happened in South Korean domestic politics this week? Well, the biggest uh, domestic news of the week was that the People Power Party finally elected their official leader. It's the first time that the PPP has had an an, uh, an, an official leader in seven months. Mm. Han dong has now been the, uh, elected in the party primaries. Wow, I'm so surprised. Yeah, it was a big shock to everyone who's not paid attention. <laughs> but jokes aside, Han was a front runner for a long time. And if you'd like to know more about the implications of Han's selection as the party's official leader, please subscribe for more. And week ahead, not really week ahead, but today, on Friday, there is a second round of something nicknamed impeachment hearing against Hume, but it's really not impeachment hearing. But the It's just theatrics, really. Right, but they will discuss some allegations related to the First Lady on today on Friday. Um, not for the first time. Not for the first time, and they will probably continue doing that in coming weeks as well. Right. So again, please subscribe if you want to know more. And all of this week ahead information will be sent to your email inboxes. And that's a wrap. Thanks for tuning in. If you want to know more, sign up for our daily executive briefings. We brief you on all you need to know from the past 24 hours and why they matter every morning in your inboxes. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast for your weekly dose of insight. And until next time, I'm Jungmin Kim. And I'm John Lee. Stay connected, stay informed, and we'll see you next time on the Great Pro Podcast.